Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Powerful Partnerships, Connecting with Family. We are so happy to be able to present to you all this afternoon. I am Nakia Irby. I am one of the educational improvement consultants here at Wayne Risa, and I have the pleasure of presenting with my colleagues today. Ladies, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Kai Smith, and I'm also an educational improvement consultant with Wayne Risa. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hello, I'm Carol Ann Paul. Again, I am an educational improvement consultant at Wayne Risa. I'm really looking forward to taking this journey with you today. Thank you, ladies. So as I stated, we are here for powerful partnerships. We're going to be talking about connecting with families. So our outcomes today are basically um, put into an acronym that we've created for you for POWER. So the P stands for partnership, and it basically lets us re reminds us that relationships and trust are the cornerstone to our family engagement. And the O is for opportunities, because we all have an opportunity to create that positive learning environment so that we can contribute to our families feeling engaged and connected to our school environment. Then the W stands for welcoming. Every family member, every student, every staff member, when they walk onto your campus or in your district, they should feel welcome. They should feel like their needs are being addressed based on the things that you have put in place for them. The E stands for engagement. These are all of those activities that you have planned. Some of you may have started school this week or last week, or you're getting ready to start school next week. So all of those fun things that you plan for them to participate in, and even those things that may not be as fun, but they're informative. So that's where the engagement comes in. And then the R stands for responsibility. So our families are engaged and supported partners in our children's education. And so they have a responsibility to send us the best that they have, which is what they do. And we have a responsibility to care and show concern for those individual students and to make sure that their needs are being met because of the instructional practices that we have in place. So those are our outcomes for today. And you're going to receive a copy of that. Um, before we end our session today. So if you were trying to take copious notes, you don't have to worry about doing that. We're going to make sure that all of the material that we're sharing with you is available to you. So again, thanks for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Kai. So now, now that we're getting started, now we really, really want to hear from you. So let's do a quick little self-assessment. It won't take us very long, just two minutes. How do you currently engage with your families? We want to know. So in the chat, you're going to have about two minutes to place your total based on the items listed here for your schools or districts current practices. So think about those things. For example, so our school holds an open house night, a parent night for all students and parents to attend. So in that case, you would give yourself one point. So remember the greatest possible um, total of points is 15. And that's for those of you that have engaged families in all of the ways that are listed here, okay? So what questions might you have before we go ahead and get started? Okay, so there looks like there's no questions. So let's go ahead and get started with family engagement by the numbers. So as you can see, we have a lot of eights. We have a, probably about three or four 12s in the chat. We have some 10s, some 11s. So we have varying ranges in numbers. Some are at the lower end, some are at the, in the middle. Now we have a great gauge of where our schools and our districts are currently at in relation to family engagement practices, right? Our hope is that by the end of our session that you will have evolved 
or adopt it, or come up with some innovative ways to engage your family partnerships. We want to um, share with you one resource that's straight from Michigan's Department of Education. So their framework provides a working definition for what family engagement really is. It is defined as a, as a collaborative relationship between families, educators, providers, and partners to support and improve the learning and development and health of every learner. That's key, of every learner. So the website provides you with resources and strategies that research demonstrates as being the most impactful to cultivating your authentic family engagement partnerships. So this is a website that we definitely uh, want you to utilize within your schools and districts, provides that framework for us. So as you can see, we provided pictures of our beautiful families on this slide as well, because we think it's important to show we're parent advocates for our children. So we've been on both sides of the fence, much like you, you've been on both sides of the fence. We understand family engagement from a parent's perspective, as well as an educator's perspective. So we get it. And we know that family engagement is multifaceted. We know the importance of shifting our thinking to we need to start doing with families and not to families, right? We have to shift our thinking today. Most of our information that we'll be utilizing today comes directly from this great resource. Next, I'm gonna share with you how we move our vision of what family engagement really truly is to those actionable practices that have a profound impact on student engagement, student learning and development. Well, I'm gonna share with you two different examples, not just one, but two different examples that are adopted straight from Michigan's very own family engagement framework that we just discussed in the previous slide. So this first example is an elementary example, and it focuses on out of all things, it's very timely, it focuses on that back to school night. So first I want you, want you to start really focusing and honing in on over here to the right, the lower impact. We're gonna look at the lower impact activity to the right, and then we're gonna take it all the way over to the left where it moves towards that higher impact, okay? And as we're looking at this, I want you to take note of some noticings and wonderings as we move from right to left. So here, back to school night, as we're looking at that lower impact, this is that panel of speakers. This is where they're passing out handbooks, student handbooks. They might even be passing out the calendar, your child's schedule, different information about the school. They might have a PowerPoint going on that tells you information in relation to the school or maybe your, um, your child's classroom or something like that. So it's really just that lower impact. And we've all been to a back to school night that's been like that. So let's shift to that moderate impact. And this is when you go to an open house and maybe you are engaged in a tour with the school, you chat with teachers, you might even share information. And also you get to visit the classrooms and actually meet those teachers. And then there might be exhibitions of students work throughout the classroom or throughout the hallways. So we've all experienced that. That's that moderate impact. Now let's look at that higher impact on student learning and development. So when we look at that, if it's a back to school night class meeting, this is where families and teachers, notice families and teachers, they're sharing, they're sharing their learning strategies um, for how to help students, parents, they're reviewing key skills for students with home learning tips. It might be some, some toolkits that are sent home with the parents. There might be a um, home to school connection packet that's sent home as well with that to help um, parents and engaging with their child or they might even develop a two-way communication plan between each other on how they're gonna communicate throughout the rest of the school year, whether it be Remind 101 or here's my phone number, here's my email address um, and, and sharing and engaging in that way so that there's that two-way communication. So now I wanna hear from you, what did you notice and or what are you still wondering about as we unpack this example and move from right to left, that lower impact to the higher impact? Or I also want you to think about this too. Or what else could we be, what else could have been added to these examples to maximize that impact? I'm gonna give you a moment to think, and I want you to come off of chat or either drop in the chat what your thoughts and noticings and wonders are around that. 
Hi, I love the higher impact um, examples that are there, but I would also like to see an opportunity for families to ask questions and receive answers right on the spot. I just recently went to a back to school night for one of my children and they told us that we could leave questions in the question box and they would get back with us uh, because they were running short on time because it was grade level by grade level, hour by hour. And I felt as a parent that that wasn't very responsive because there were some things I wanted answers to right then. So that would be my suggestion for an addition to the higher impact. And I think that's a wonderful example, Nakia. Uh, the more that we can engage our parents and hear from them and lift their voice and um, make their voice present within all that we do within the school would make a big difference in how we help our students to, um, to achieve at their highest levels. So the more that you can get that, that parental voice out there, that's what you wanna do. And you should, it shouldn't be a footnote at the end, because I said, remember I said, we're parent advocates and we're educator advocates. So we know how it feels. So it shouldn't be a footnote at the end, leave it in the box. No, that should be something that's ongoing throughout that um, open house or that back to school night. In the chat, we have Natalie that says student activities instead of just targeting parents. Yes, student activities instead of just targeting parents. Okay, now we're gonna move on to this next example. You know, if we gave you an elementary example, we better give you a secondary example. So looking at how we move from a vision of what family engagement is to those actionable practices, now let's look at this secondary example. Let's start by looking right at the lower impact, the same way we're gonna look from the right to the left. What are some noticings and wonderings as we unpack this example? I want you to begin to think about that. And then what else would you add to this example? This is a transitional program. So if we're looking at the lower impact, it's just at, at orientation, families are picking up their students' class schedules, their bus passes, um, they're touring the school. Uh, they might get more information around the school. They might get um, their books on that day. Um, to start school. So just lower impact in that way. So now let's move to that moderate impact. This is when we're offering a fall family academy to orient incoming families to expectations of students, such as attendance requirements and credits needed for great advancement and graduation. Um, so you have those families come into your school and you tell them all the information that they need to know. You tell them about attendance, how important it is to the school. You might give them more information around the school. Um, you might provide guidance as far as uh, uh, students that are gonna be graduating and what they need to, um, to graduate. So as we transition to a higher impact on student learning and development, within this transition program, this is when you have an event where you have a feeder school and you have tours of the new school from your feeder school, and you have a four week school prep summer course that welcomes families. And this is what you're doing during that time span. So you're conveying college and career prep. For example, your student will graduate in four years with their college acceptance in hand. And this is what you need to do in order to get to those to that step. You're gonna relate academic programs to careers and get them career um, ready. You're gonna prepare students for middle and high school work, and you're gonna help families construct their role in supporting their students' success. You wanna really um, gather some street data so that you can illuminate the voices of your families. We just talked about that, how important that is. That's, that's key to helping your families and your students. You can gather family and student perception data and have by having a listening session campaign, um, or how impactful would it be if you can co-construct the transition program? with your parents. Like how big is that? That's just a, a big motivator. So I'll just go ahead with some of my examples of, on how we can really maximize the impact. You definitely, you wanna work side by side, co-constructing anything that is for parents, their voice needs to be at the table. So definitely having them a part of that process, a part, a part of that conversation of what you would want a transition program to look like. What would be more beneficial to, to you as a parent? Having that lens is really going to help you to have to cultivate most meaningful um, transition program. And also making their voices heard and centering them in the process. What an impact. 
we would be able to plan specifically around their needs, their wants, so that we can maximize their experience. Now at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn as she will share more on family partnership opportunities. Thank you, Kai. If partnerships are built on trust, we really need to first understand our own beliefs about family involvement. When we begin partnering with families in the ways that Kai was talking about, using those high leverage strategies and activities, it's best to understand what our own personal beliefs are. Start with self and work your way outward. For example, here are my belief statements about partnering with families. So I believe that all families have dreams for their children and they want the best for them. I also think that all families can support their children's learning. I truly believe that families are equal partners. And last, I feel that the responsibility for building and sustaining partnership between school, home, and community really starts with me. As a former district leader, I really needed to be the best example for staff regarding messaging and supporting families. I needed to walk the walk and talk the talk. So Brene Brown has curated information around trust and she found that trust is actually not a grand gesture, but instead it's all the little things that we do to build trust. It's kind of like a marble jar. Have you ever used one of those in your classrooms before? A teacher pops a marble into a jar each time students as a collective do something perhaps generous or to show gratitude. And when the marble jar fills up, then the class has a celebration. Well, trust is like that as well. It's all those little things you do with families to create that trusting relationship. There are several components of trust. And to remember, we're gonna use that acronym that Brene Brown has brought forward, which is called BRAVING. The components of trust are having boundaries, like being rooted in reliability, holding each other accountable, being a vault, and not telling someone else's story. Having integrity, being non-judgmental, and being generous with your assumptions. Let me give you an example. When a teacher co-creates classroom norms or rules with students, and then everyone holds each other accountable, this defines boundaries and also accountability. And this is a layer of building trust. Okay, so let's say that you tell families that you're gonna send a newsletter out and you list all of your publication dates. You can build trust just by sticking to the schedule. There's also something called emotional trust. Emotional trust is something that comes uh, with time often. And it has a lot to do with a bond with a person because you know their story and you also know their perspective. So for example, when a parent comes into the classroom and you greet them by name, and you ask them how their father is doing because he just had knee surgery. That's like putting a marble in the jar and it builds a trusting relationship. Remember, it's all the little things that we do in order to fill up that jar. It's not one big grand gesture. So if we want to fill up each other's jars, what else can we do? To help us build trusting relationships, Schools need to better understand staff and students, caregivers, and also the community. So let me ask you, in the chat, what kind of ways do you collect data from your families right now? So let's list all the ways that we collect data right now from our families. All right, I'm seeing surveys. Absolutely. Conferences, yes. End of your surveys, perfect. Oh, at the beginning of the year, I send out a questionnaire. Oh, they're coming in fast now. Class Dojo, um, Google Forms, Google Forms to collect interest about involvement. I see a lot of Google Forms in there. That's wonderful. Phone conferences, phone conversations, wonderful. So we have a lot of data being collected. Thanks for participating in our chat. So as you can see, um, surveys and a lot of other ways are actually being listed in the chat as ways that we grab um, data from our parents. So if you use the QR code on the screen, you can view several other ways to collect data from your constituents as well. All of the information was curated actually from a book called Street Data. If you have an opportunity, um, you know, try to take a look at that. It's a very good read. So one way you can collect data is by conducting a listening campaign. And this was actually um, something that was added to the chat. 
This involves a set of one-on-one -on -one interviews or focus groups. And after collecting quotes from the group, you then assemble and organize them by theme. The data are usually shared out community-wide as an opportunity for growth and reflection. And your school can gain insight and empathy by conducting these listening campaigns. The authors of Street Data actually suggest that um, you do listening campaigns to gain insight and empathy towards a group of people at the margins, perhaps, for example, parents of English learners. So that might be a group that you would um, bring in in order to gain a little bit more insight. Another way to collect information is through audio feedback interviews. And instead of um, collecting quotes, by writing them down, you would actually auto record the focus group with students or parents whose voices are typically absent from the decision making table. You're going to begin by actually identifying some sort of equity challenge that you want to gain more insight around. So if you look at your surveys and you find that there might be some sort of equity challenge that's being pulled out of your surveys, you want to then grab parents or students and you want to collect more information. And that's what you would do by having um, the audio feedback interview. Uh, you can often present this data at staff meetings. However, you need to be very careful that you're not identifying who is actually um, in those focus groups. Um, home visits are powerful and they can deepen your understanding of neighborhoods, communities, and family life. So when conducting home visits, be brief, make sure that you have a little something to share with the families. Like for example, you could bring school supplies, school swag, or even a helpful informational packet about the upcoming school year. Some alternatives to home visits would be to meet in some sort of community space, like a church or a library, or you could also conduct those one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings as well. Understanding each other is another way that we can build trust. That's really important. So when collecting information and data, we then want to publish it for all to see. So the school really needs to make it clear to the public why they are doing whatever action they are doing and make it transparent that it's based on a few data sets. Maybe student and parent interviews are being done. You have your survey data, and then you also have observations you triangulate those three data pieces, and then you communicate to your public, um, you know, some of the actions that you're going to be taking based on that data. So when we think about the secret sauce for engaging with families, there is much power in trust. Have you ever heard of someone saying, uh, yeah, you can trust him or her. I know them personally. So relationships are really built on trust, but it's hard to trust people when we don't actually know them. So if you don't know your community, chances are that they don't know you. So as a former central office administrator, I used to ask myself a series of questions and these questions and my beliefs really set the stage for powerful partnerships. You're going to find these questions using the QR code on the screen, and here are a few of them. One might be, how long have families lived in these neighborhoods and have had children attending the school district where I work? Who are the leaders that influence different communities? What are the assets in the community? Uh, what languages are spoken in our communities? If families live in poverty, is it due to any recent changes or the local economy? So these are just a few questions that I would lev uh, leverage. There are a series of them if you use that QR code. We are going to be watching a video of a parent. And um, there is a powerful partnership going on. And what we'd like for you to do is to jot down two or three things the teacher did in order to build trust with this parent. And then after, we're going to ask you to share a few ideas in the chat, or you can go ahead and open up that mic and do it verbally. Um, well, immediately after the home visit, I was then invited to a back to school night they were having in Staten. They gave me the little flyer. I was like, well, you know, we having a back to school night. It's from this time and this time. Bring the kids, you know, like a meet and greet the teachers and everyone that was going to be there. 
But one thing I can say about, you know, satin period is that it is constant communication, something I never had, something I completely enjoy. And it's not just negative communication, it's constant positive communication. Mm -hmm. I can be here at home, at work, anywhere, and one of my teachers would send me a text. Or I used to love it, Miss Lucas would um, send pictures. Take pictures of them doing classwork and she said, you'll see, look how I am my daughter, Tanae, well, I call her Bird. The school calls her Bird, which I love because it's like a community. They adopted her nickname. So she would send me a text like, look at Bird. She's having a wonderful day today and she's doing good. But in saying that, that allowed me to hear. It put a trust. I put a trust in Miss Lucas for doing that. So no matter what she said, how she had to say it, what the information is, it made it easier for me to uh, receive it from her because she had built this communication, this trust that I never had. You know, so I, I tell people now friendship. You know what I'm saying? We're not friends and talk every single day, but she's a person that will always, I will always hold in a high regard. She will always have my respect. I really respect Miss Lucas and I value her so much because not just her, but all the teachers, but like she was the first one to really extend herself to me and I would get the text and then one day Tanae had a bad day and she called me and I was expecting to get something good oh you know she got good on her test so she did read she was like well we had a bit of an issue today I'm like for real mm -hmm. what happened well you know Tanae did x y and z and I didn't get defensive I didn't get well what do you do or what did I actually sat back and I listened and I received the information, you know, and I processed the information. For me, that was something different because at that point in time, I felt it like, why am I getting mad? Because normally when you call me on the phone and you're telling me something about my child did this, I'm naturally on the defense. Like, well, what did you do to make my child do this? Or who was messing with her in class because my baby's a good baby? But it's, and this time it was different. And I don't know if it's because of the positive, you know, feedback she gives me every day. The friendship we bought, it just made, when she was telling me what was going on, I took a breath, I stopped, and I listened. You know, and then I was like, we actually got to a page where we worked together. I said, well, you know what, since she's having a bad day, you know, can you put her on the phone? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, you know, I spoke with her on the phone, and I let her know that me and Miss Lucas are working together. We are a team, you know, and if she asks you to do something, you need to treat it as if mommy is asking you to do something. So if she asks you to sit down, you need to sit down. And there was no more problems with today. Mm -hmm. What a powerful video. All right, so we're looking for a few things that you noted in the video. How did that teacher build trust and partnership with this parent? I see in the chat that someone said, sending her pictures of her child actually learning, yes sending her updates on behavior, sending her updates on academics. Yes, there were also um, some home visits. There was a personal invitation for that meet and greet. Someone else in the chat had noted that there was a compliment sandwich going on when it come, came to criticism of the student. So they made sure that um, the message you know, was received in a positive manner. So that way the parent the teacher and the student could work on whatever was happening. Opportunities for growth were shared. I also noticed that the school was willing to use that nickname in order to build community and extend themselves to the parent, making her feel comfortable like a family. I love that, Nakia. So now that we've reviewed the concept of trust and partnership, where do we start? Allow yourself, your true self, to show up at school and with parents. If you feel comfortable, share something about yourself with your community. For example, perhaps you have a dog, uh, you could share some of that information, or I have seen where a teacher or administrator really talks about a time when they were challenged and how they overcame that challenge. So just making sure that you have that personal touch and that you're showing up for real at um, your school. Another way you can build trust is to generously listen to others. This means distraction-free zone, right? So if you're talking with a parent or a, a student or anyone, really, just making sure that you're being very generous with your listening. You're free from distractions like that cell phone. Another way to um, build trust is to actually 
understand ourselves first, like I had mentioned before, right? What, what do you believe? So we can identify kind of how we see the world and we want to make sure that we're thinking about all those little interactions that we have with parents because all those little things, remember, fill up another person's marble jar. So like asking your student council to have a voice in a major decision or transparently acting upon data or creating a family support group, all of these little things are putting trust marbles in the jar. These are some really concrete ways that you can build that trusting relationship. Now I'm going to hand it over to Nakia, who's going to talk about the heart and the brain. Thanks so much, Carolyn. I love that building that trust jar using the analogy of having those marbles in the jar. Just every little step definitely helps. So I wanted to talk about what it means to be welcoming, our W in power. And the, we know that the heart and the brain are intimately connected, right? So when we practice empathy, we actually begin to understand more about the students and the families that we interact with. And we're able to apply empathy in a number of ways. So as you'll see start to populate on the slide, we want to have you think about how have you practiced empathy with your family or how have you seen empathy being practiced with families? Think about how once the beginning of the pandemic came into play, how all of us had to pivot to accommodate the needs of families. We saw schools taking their focus from off the test scores and report cards to on are my families being fed and do they have what they need in order to be able to make it from day to day? I saw this shift happening throughout Wayne County and I heard about it happening throughout the world. So we begin to truly get back to understanding those basic needs that we know have to be met before families can even be open to receiving the learning. And we're still shifting as we prepare to come back to schools again this fall, right? In the midst of we're still in the pandemic, but we've learned some things, right? We've learned how to better take care of ourselves so that we won't be so at risk. But we also have learned that that practice of empathy really does help us in building relationships. So the three layers that are outlined on your screen, at the lowest level, what you see there with the brain picture, that's the cognitive, knowing how the other person feels. Then we move up to the emotional, where you see those two puzzle pieces coming together. This is when we start to feel really that connectedness between our emotions and our experiences of family. But last but not least, that compassionate layer, understanding with a high level of concerns and being willing to support our parents without judgment. We learned so much, especially when we had to be virtual. Parents made all kinds of accommodations to make sure school could still happen in their homes. Schools made so many accommodations to just even providing devices and hotspots so that students could connect. But then we had to allow a little bit of flexibility and empathy and understanding that those students weren't home alone. A lot of them were home with brothers and sisters or even with their parents. And we had to take into consideration that even though they were still learning in a school, it, it wasn't the regular school environment. We should think of this as an equity check. When we're dealing with our families and we're trying to figure out how can we best serve them, we have to be consistent in how we engage in empathy. So in order to do that, we have to reflect on some of these questions when we're making decisions or even selecting our resources to support and communicate with our families. Before we decide on a new initiative, a strategy, or a resource for support, we have to stop and think about some of these questions that you see on the screen. To operate in an authentic, welcoming mindset means to operate with empathy and equity. So we ask ourselves the question, who is this actually for? And how do we know? And can we identify someone for whom this is not true? Because I can't service you well if I'm not considering your needs and taking an approach, an approach that will ensure that there is some clear understanding, communication, and inclusiveness in our approach. So as a true partner, I need that voice of the parents and the students at the table. And I don't just want them at the table. I want to value the input that they may have. So I need to be able to ask myself when I'm pulling things together, pulling committees, task force, whose voice is missing? Whose voice actually needs to be heard? Because in some instances, we're not serving the student needs. Sometimes we're serving the adult needs. 
And we need to be very mindful of who is it that we're trying to serve and what are the implications of that decision. Um, Carolyn just provided for you a list of these questions and more um, that you can actually reflect on. And then the last thing I wanted to share with you was that we can actually build ourselves our, an action plan. As we're dealing with our parents and our communities and our students, we can start to actually think about how can we get all of our parents and our students and our families' voices to the table. So we referred to the MDE Michigan Family Resource Guide earlier. And what we did was we basically made a template for you. And we'll drop this link in the chat for you as well. But we invite you to think of this template as something that you can use as you're designing your activities of engagement for your students. This is our responsibility to be proactive in thinking about how we can fulfill our role as educators in the child's life. But it also will help us think about how do we get our families involved in that as well. So it's a very simple template. It just gives you the opportunity to think about your current practice and where you actually wanna be, what's that desired state. And then you can start to list out what are some of the steps that you need to take in order to get there. Because just as the quote says that's on the screen, when we have great power, that comes with great responsibility. And we know that comes from our friendly superhero Spider-Man movie. So if any of you have seen that, you've heard that quote over and over again, and it is very true still today. So I hope that that template will be able to help you as you guide yourselves into this new school year. And I'll turn it over to Kai. Yep, she's going to share the template with you. And this resource that she's getting ready to share actually has everything on it that we've talked about today. We would like to share a curation of different resources and strategies that we put together for you. So we definitely have our presentation. Along with our presentation, we also have that powerful partnership action plan that Nakia just talked about as well as your power infograph that we focus most of our learning on today and our outcomes. And then we also included some toolkits, roadmaps, and frameworks that you can utilize. One of them is that Michigan Family um, Engagement Framework that we talked about, as well as flamboyant. And also we've included some really great articles for you to engage in um, either with your team, with your school teams, or just to help you with your research as you move and delve into really looking at uh, cultivating your, um, your parent partnerships. We also have the video that we utilize today as well as other videos that are helpful. We have strategies for engaging your parents, virtual family, SCL resource center. Just gonna go here really quick. You can take this and utilize it and edit it and create your own copy to use with your um, school or district. Last but most, most certainly not least, as we talked about data and different ways to collect data, please make sure that you utilize this wonderful infograph um, that we put together on family perception data and try and really hone in on those different ways in which you can engage your families and collect um, data and really get to illuminate their voice within your process and how, you, how you're engaging them. Along with that, we have some data collection questions that we've cultivated, that we've um, curated, and also an equity check infograph for you, as well as a pre-assessment for a home visit and a listening campaign sample that you can just take and utilize for you within your schools. So, I know that was a whole lot of information, but guess what? You only have to go to one place to get that information. So all you have to do is scan that QR code or the link has been dropped in within the chat. And then you can go there anytime to have a chance to really um, look at these tips and resources for partnering with your families. Okay, so now it's time to power up. It is time to power up. So now we've equipped you with many ways in which to engage or cultivate or sustain those family partnerships, which we know are so important. But before we conclude, we would love to invite your voice into this space for a brief collective reflection around these questions. Here they are. What current family engagement practices do you employ that we can build upon to have a profound impact on student learning and development? And also, what kind of data are we currently collecting that might help us when thinking about family engagement? 
with whom do we need to share today's learning with to support our efforts to move us even further within this process? And which area might you delve deeper into with your school or district team? So let me invite you once again to either come off of, come off of mute or either add to the chat some of your thoughts around any of those questions. Anything that someone wants to lift up or add to this space at this time. Perhaps it's something that we haven't thought of or something that's still kind of percolating with you around this, um, this subject area or something that's resonating with you from what we shared today. Any shares? Uh, I would like to say, uh, first of all, that uh, I thank you for the plethora of information and uh, that today I am a uh, returning retiree um, back into the school system now. And I'm really enjoying working with uh, my uh, cognitively and, and autistic impaired uh, children. And I find that um, most of the information that you covered, well, all of the information that you covered uh, is very helpful uh, with parents today because we have so many other challenges uh, that we're faced with, you know, socially with, you know, the, the media and all of that. And that um, maintaining an open line of communication uh, with the parents, I think is really most, most valuable. And, uh, and you can't go wrong. And I find that soliciting the needs of my parents and, you know, asking them, are there, you know, what are your concerns? You know, what concerns do you have for your child so that we can work together and the, to make sure that there's a carryover from school to home and home to school. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Way. You lifted a lot of the things that we've already been talking about, but you just brought it to home. So really soliciting the needs of our parents and making their voice a part of that process. You definitely mentioned that. You also mentioned about nowadays we're up against so many with so many things socially and with media. And so definitely having the, those open lines of that two-way communication um, open with our parents and cultivating those relationships really helps to um, move our students forward. Here's a couple shares in the chat. I appreciate all the resources inviting parents into the classroom might help with engagement. Also inviting parents to eat lunch with the class. These dates would be established in time for parents that work. Definitely, I think that's really big and huge and trying to um, just really um, bridge that gap with parents and, and teachers and just really helping to really cultivate that relationship. The parents that eat lunch with the class. Wow. I love it. I love it. I love it. Frenia said, when I first started at the elementary school that I am in, I connected with the principal with a local community center director of the community center. And I always tend to have those resources available to students and families. That is definitely a huge one. You really want to look at your external partners and cultivate those relationships as well, because they can definitely help um, your school, your classroom, um, and ultimately your families, um, which will ultimately help to help to support the school and the district. So you definitely want to um, look at those businesses that are surrounding your school or your districts and reach out to them and build those relationships. Very good, thank you for sharing. So I'm gonna move right over to ending our session. So please feel free, more than free, welcomed um, to reach out to us. Here's our contact information where we can be reached. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for this collective engagement today and your dedication to continuing to be parent advocates as well as educator advocates to ensure impactful impactful partnerships with your families. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you for joining.